It's our honor and our pleasure to be joined by the great Gerald J. Sussman. It's difficult to sum up all of Jerry's achievements and contributions to computer science, but let me attempt with the following. Jerry is a professor of electrical engineering at MIT. He has been involved in artificial intelligence, programming languages, and science education. He has also co-created Scheme with Guy Steele. Jerry is very well known for his work on structure interpretation of computer programs, or fondly known as SICP or SICP, a reference textbook that is often cited as one of the best in terms of elegance and functional purity. He recently published another amazing book titled Software Design for Flexibility. We're going to hear about a few interesting developments of some of the ideas there. I would ask the audience members to get these books ready if you have them. Take it away, Jerry. Well, thank you. Uh, I am very pleased to be here. Uh, and uh, I wanted to thank Tovia and uh, uh, Marcus for uh, being just before me. I listened to their talks. And they were very interesting. Uh, of course, I, I am the stuff I was doing is mostly for very advanced students at MIT, graduate students and undergraduates at, at the advanced level in, in, in physics and in mathematics type subjects. Um, although SICP was for originally for freshmen. But today what li I'd like to talk to you about is stuff that's brand new. It's sort of hot out of the gray matter, as we would say. Uh, it's not completely worked out, okay? And it's sort of what I've been thinking about recently. So I suppose we'll get onto it. Let me see if I can advance my slides, yes, okay? What I'd like is to make systems that are easy to change. That's the most important idea, okay? That they have the property that they can be adapted easily to unforeseen needs, that they're flexible, that they're incremental, and I don't see a lot of detail. One of my biggest goals, you see, is to improve the expressiveness of programming. All my life, I've thought about programming as being something like other linguistic disciplines, like mathematics or, when, or English text, okay? It's an expressive medium that you write things down in, and you know, can be write beautiful things. You can write beautiful programs like poetry, okay? Or Maxwell's equations are beautiful. You can write prose and Maxwell's equations when using it to describe the way electromagnetic radiation works, that's prose, it's describing the world, okay? You can make art and music and all of those things are, are, are a kind of expressive mediums and programming is another kind of expressive medium where we make expressions that we couldn't say in other languages. So you know, I wanted, the goal is to figure out how to say things that are otherwise hard to say. The current programming styles we have in most languages and, and most of programming in general is ponderous. The elaborations we want to ex express an idea complicate the expressions. And I'll be more clear about that. Okay, so here's an example. Now, I'm sorry that I happen to like parentheses. I did replace the colons that I would use in Lisp or Scheme with dollar signs because I found out that in your language, uh, closure uh, colons mean something else. <laughs> so I put in, these are presumably perfectly good variable names. But here's a, a simple program that computes the current in the junction diode. As an electrical engineer, you might know what that means given the voltage across the diode. It doesn't matter, you don't have to know what it means, okay? So it's a simple program and it's a, a product of the uh, uh, saturation current and an expression which contains various physical constants like the charge on an electron and, the, and Boltzmann's constant and the absolute temperature and things like that and the voltage that I'm measuring, okay? So that's what this is. Uh, and I wanna be able to say things about this program. First of all, these they're, they're, the, the voltages and things like that are inexact numbers with specified uncertainties. There are units. The vo voltage is in volts. The current is in amperes. The uh, charge is in coulombs. The te temperature is in kelvins. And, the, again, and Boltzmann's constant is joules per degree Kelvin. And the result is in amperes. I want provenance. I want to make sure that something goes wrong. I know who to blame. Where did I get this data? The data might be wrong. So the company that made the diode, perhaps, International Rectifier Company, has to be able to sign the, sat the saturation current for the diode. That Boltzmann's constant and the charge on an on, on electron are published by 
the National Institute of Science and Technology every few years. They bear the best estimates of the, of the uh, physical constants. Perhaps I measured the temperature in the room I'm working in. The formula that this, this is, curls from from a book by Searle and Gray, okay? And the procedure happened to be written by me. And then there are reasonable constraints. I could never have a voltage for this diode bigger than one volt. By that, I'd have thousands of amperes going through it and it would go boom, okay? So I wanna put in constraints like that, okay? But I want more. I want checking my units and reasonable constraints at runtime and compile time where possible. I want symbolic partial evaluation so I can look at these things as, as symbolic expressions as well as numerical. And you, you I suppose Tovia and, and, uh, and Marcus were showing some of that with the kinds of code that I tend to write. I want symbolic partial evaluation. So as I said that, I want estimate of the uncertainty. That, that one I don't know how to do, but that's what I want. I want tracking of the dependencies. So if I get a wrong answer, I want to know who to blame. Is it the person who wrote the program like me? Is it, the, is it somebody gave me a wrong value for the physical constant? I want to know who did it, okay? I want, I, I, so I want that sort of thing. I want the automatic derivatives of my program and integrals perhaps. I want the derivatives integrals to in, in, inherit the same annotations, okay? And I want the annotations to be incremental and additive, requiring almost no change to the, my code. Now, here's the big one. I have a very beautiful program. See over there? This is a tiny little program. It's simple, okay? It is elegant. It doesn't say any more than it needs to. However, I want to be able to add all this information without may burying that program in a mess of declarations that make it impossible to read or be understood. So I wanted to invent a new idea, which I call layering, and that uh, that's a very hard problem, whereby it is the case that I can sort of do what an architect does, okay? That an architect, in the, at least the old days, they would sketch a, a plan on a big board, right? For some structure they wanna make. And then they have to, have to after the plan is sort of explains what rooms there are and things like that, and the sort of what hallways and stuff like that. Then they put a piece of plastic down on top of it and draw in the next layer, which might be something like how the elevator connects or, uh, how the HVAC, the, the heating, uh, the ventilation and air conditioning system is built in. And then another layer where the plumbing goes, okay? And each of those things has to be sketched in on top. But those layers don't destroy the basic plan. The plan has not become too complicated. If you take off the layers, you can see the original plan, okay? So that's sort of what I, I care about. Now, we don't know the, all the answers. So of course, my friend Chris and I, uh, who by the way, Chris worked for me at MIT for 26 years. Then he worked for Google for about 10 years and now he's doing something else. I'm, but I'm not sure I want to talk about that. But in any case, uh, we wrote a book about this and we, we don't really know all the answers. This is, we put down our, what we, I would say is uh, our current best estimate at the time, which is about a couple of years ago. And I want to consider one less developed idea, the layering idea, the one I've been trying to tell you about, okay? So first I want to say a little bit about, about the fundamental ideas in this book, okay? There is a, the very bottom of it is something called predicate dispatched extensible generics. We know what generic procedures are. For example, in all LISPs, the addition operator adds uh, adds integers, it can add floating point numbers. It probably in, in, a, in a scheme, it can deal with complex numbers, rational fractions, okay? And not only that, they mix correctly. And that's so, that's, so it's, it's, a, it's a generic operation, say addition, okay? On the other hand, uh, the, the people don't usually make it so it's easily extensible. Python allows some of those things for very simple operations. They call them dunder methods, which I'm not sure I care about. You know, but the bottom line is, what if we wanted to make it so it's completely general that all we have to do is say that a, that a predicate determines what kind of thing something is, and we dispatch on those predicates okay, to determine what, what handler is appropriate for every operation. Okay? 
That's actually how we implement the forward mode automatic differentiation that was uh, nicely explained by Tovia. Okay, if you look here, this is what we have. We extend all of the primitive operations to handle the dual dual objects, dual numbers, which were invented, by the way, in the 1870s by the famous mathematician Clifford. Okay. The dual numbers, the dual numbers, you pass, if you pass a dual number through a function, it should produce the function's value and the derivative of the function's value as, as, as multiplied by the increment. So that the chain rule is automatically, automatically uh, correctly implemented because if I take this, this output and pass it through G, I get the correct answer for the, uh, for the, the, the base value, the, the primal value. And I get the correct value for the derivative, which is at the evaluated at the correct places. Okay. That's a that's just one kind of thing you can do when you have when you have automatic different sorry automatic differentiation. One thing you can do when you generically extend your uh, arithmetic of all the possible functions to deal with say a new kind of object that was not thought of before, and this should be done easily. Okay, so that's. That's an example of that, but also it can deal with, with, uh, with symbolic expressions and everything else once you do that. Now, but layering is not the same as generic procedures. It's similar in the following way. Generic procedures extend a procedure so it can operate on data it could not have operated on before the extension. When we extend addition to append strings, okay, would apply to strings, we can do that. But with layering, the data potentially has metadata associated with it. And the procedures are extended with the metadata. So an example of metadata is, for example, the units. Okay, An example of that metadata is the provenance, is the, is the support set, where that came from, who, who, to, who signed for it, okay? for that data. And, the, the, and what you want to do is extend the, all the procedures to operate on the metadata as well as the data in parallel with the operation on the data. So for example, when we add a units layer, okay, we extend multiplication to do multiplication of the data as well as pro produce the units for the product, which basically adds the exponents, okay, if you want to think of it that way, in, in the, in the, uh, for each of the units. Of course, the metadata is itself data, so it may have its own metadata. So it's a whole, it's a whole other thing besides just generics. And although in the, what I showed you before here, we implemented the automatic differentiation in scheme utils as a generic extension to arithmetic, it can also be implemented as a layer because the automatic differentiator must compute the value as well as the derivative to make the chain rule work, as you just saw here. It's computing the value as well as the derivative. It computes the value as well as the derivative, okay? So let's do an example of, of layering, just to show you what it's like. Okay. So we go back to the, the example I had before, because it's small enough to fit on a screen. I mean, I like big examples, but, <laughs> but the small examples are appropriate for the screen. So here we have this, again, method of computing a current given a voltage based on some other data that's given to us from somewhere else, okay? So here we have the saturation current, the uh, electron charge, Boltzmann's constant, and the, te the abs absolute temperature in degrees Kelvin of the room. And over here we have the result. The result is, what's it, 1.2 milliampers. That's a reasonable number for that kind of diode. But now we add provenance. Let's sign each of these pieces of information. The manufacturer can sign the saturation current. So I'm changing IS to be the signed version of IS. The physical constants are periodically published by the National Institute of Science and Technology. So I sign Q and I sign K by those by, by, by where I get that data. I personally sign the temperature because I measured it. I have the thermometer, okay? And I signed the voltage I'm, I'm putting in because I'm, that, because I'm doing the experiment. And what I get out now is more information. I get the base value, which is indeed 
1.2 milliamp years. We'll worry about units later. And I get these are the these are all of the sources that this value depended upon. Now, I consider this to be a very important idea because consider all of the great scientific papers that are written in, say, places like medicine, okay, or biology, biomedicine. Many of them are actually are wrong, okay, because an experiment turns out later to have not been done right or something like that. But there's a huge pile of, of, of deductions based on those, those papers. And supposing if we find something really is wrong after much deduction, wouldn't it be nice to be able to mark all of the tree and say, there's something wrong in this tree. And we mark it from, we see another case where something's wrong, mark all the, that tree. Then we find, hey, the intersection is this paper that's got the wrong, uh, uh, wrong measurement. And maybe might, might make things move much faster in that science. Say, also, but I'm going to keep going with this. Let's make, add more, more information. The, the, the formula was itself signed by the source book I got it out of, Searle and Gray, okay? And I wrote the code. So I'm gonna, oh no, I'm sorry, that's not yet. I'm just checking that, that still works. Okay, that's just added. But, and the code still works, of course, with unsigned inputs. But later I can seal the procedure. I can say the current, I signed it, the current, the, current, the procedure, that measure that that computes the current. That's ID. Okay, going back there, just to remember that that's what it is. ID is the procedure that computes the current. Okay, that was being signed by me because I wrote the code. And now, if I look at the the result of calling that procedure on 0.6 volts, okay, that I had measured. Okay, I have two layers of 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 uh, the result. The ultimate result is the 1.2 milliamps, that has its own as a providence how it was computed, okay, including all of the, the, all of the um, ingredients that went into it, but also there's providence for that, that, that structure, which is that it was because I produced, I passed in a number, which was signed by v, GJSV into the code that I wrote. So this is providence of the, of the, of the code that processed it might be argued that we should flatten this, of uh, that's easy. But the real bottom line is that, that's, that they, I'm collecting that information, okay? Now, real complicated programs are much more complicated. Okay? For example, in a, in, there are conditionals and loops. So here's a nice little looping program, does nothing very much. It says, given the count, count of n I want to compute, uh, if n is zero, then I'm done, okay? Otherwise, I want to ca count uh, by subtracting one from n and go around this loop, okay? Now, remember, um, scheme is, is tail recursive, so this is this does not, is not intended to push any stack, okay? Now, that's going to produce a complication, which we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. But in any case, every, I'm, put, I'm signing every level, a piece of this, the zero, which I'm comparing with N, is signed by Frodo. Uh, the job being done, the, the done result is signed by me. And the, uh, uh, the, the, the one I'm subtracting off of N is signed by Mr. Bilbo. I see somehow I got into the Lord of the Rings when I was typing this. And if I uh, call this by asking Sam Ritchie to give me a number, <laughs> okay, actually that might be Sam from Lord of the Rings, I give it a, a zero, of course. The only thing that matters is these two parts of the clause. There's a predicate and the, and the consequent. Okay, so there's the Bilbo is irrelevant here. Okay, but if I ask, if I if Sam gives me five, then it goes through the entire uh, loop and therefore Bilbo is relevant also. Now, this is a complication. Anytime you deal with, with conditionals, it changes the way the interpretation mechanism works. One way to play this in a, in a real, in a standard language, the first way I did this and the way I've done it, you know, to make it work at all is by making if into a macro, a macro that, um, that uh, expands if into a slightly more complicated situation. But that basically causes the compiler to produce lousy code 
it works, but it produces lousy code. And also it, um, it also is, is very inelegant. The easy way, and the layering, because of the fact that I have to combine at the end of every, of every computation, the, the various layers, which are the, the various metadata with the data and pass it along, that would automatically kill tail recursion if it's done the, in a simple way, the easy way to do that. Because what it does is it puts extra stuff on the on the stack, which is the guy who's collecting that result. Okay. Now, in the last few weeks, actually, I've conquered this problem, and I will explain that. Okay. So that's why I'm saying this is hot out of the gray matter. <laughs> so we, the way we did it in the SDF book, we didn't have tail recursion working for for the um, uh, for layering, but now I know how to do it. Okay, so I'll tell you more about that. But in any case, just to prove that the stuff I do works, okay, I did a big problem. No, it's not a big problem. It's big enough. It's so big that I can just barely fit it on a screen, but it's small enough so it tests lots of stuff. And this is basically a Y operator like, like definition of factorial and Fibonacci. Uh, and, I'm, and, and they're co-recursive in the way I wrote it here. And so I can, I can compute uh, the factorial of five and the Fibonacci of 10, okay? And I'm getting, of course, the results, which is, and, and also the sums. So I get 55 for Fibonacci of, of 10 and uh, factorial, of, factorial of five is 120 and the sum is 175. And these are the various contribution, contributions which are based on the signatures, okay, of all the constants. This is just to make sure that everything was sort of working sensibly that the interpreter I built wasn't broken. By the way, if anybody has questions, I'm pleased to answer even if you, even if you want to interrupt me, but we can talk later as well, okay? So, so first of all, a little bit of a summary of what this is before I go further. The way the generic, the way layering works is that it's, somewhat like generic procedures, but it's not like them in, in other ways. In generic procedures, there's a single layered generic, there's a single layered object. Whoops. Unlike generic procedures, there is a single layered object data type that associates a layer name with its data or procedure. There's a base layer and there's annotation layers such as units, providence, derivatives, whatever we want to add. It could be types, okay? But it's very much like generic procedures in that a layer procedure has a handler for each layer of interest. So I have to build a handler for all of the all of the primitive objects and the way they're combined, of which the most important way of combining is, well, that's what if is, that's one way of combining. And another way of combining is by definition, by the lambda abstraction, okay? A layer procedure has a, hand, so has a handler for each layer of interest. The unlayered procedures must look only at the base layer of the layered argument, okay? And most layers are self-contained. The handler will not look at arguments other than the ones for its layer, but remember, multiplication needs more information. And that's because if I pass two arguments in to multiply, one of them is zero, then the provenance of the result is only, depends only on the provenance of the zero, because zero times anything is zero. So it doesn't matter what the, 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 ancestry of the other argument is. Um, a handler will also not generally be invoked unless arguments for the layer are provided. And there are defaults for missing layer values. So there's an empty support set for provenance. There are dimensionless quantities. There are mathematical constants. We'll, we'll worry about that. Okay. So I just want you to get the idea that it's something like generic procedures, but instead of it being, there being um, one object which is being passed through a procedure, which may have many handlers for different kinds of, of objects. Okay. Here we have a, a, an object with many layers, many parts, each of which is being, each of these parts is being sort of routed into a layer processor for that person, for the layer, for a, a layered procedure. And then the results are recombined at the end. And this has to be done Without, without killing tail recursion. So 
just to be a little bit further, a layered procedure, layering is compatible with generic procedures because a layered object is one for which there is a test for it. Layered object predicate can be used for generic dispatch. So in fact, generic procedures can have handlers for layered objects. A layered procedure is itself a layered object. The base procedure of a layered procedure can be a generic procedure. And the handler procedures can be layered procedures and they can be generic procedures. So this is all mixes together in a way that, that sort of works nicely. So first of all, I'm gonna show you, tell you what I did, okay? I'm not gonna show you the interpreter that I wrote because it's a long story, it's boring, okay? And the one great thing about it is it's generically extensible, okay? But it's a continuation passing interpreter. Now, I don't know how many of you know about continuations, that's a thing that um, is available in Scheme. But think of it this way. If I have a, 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 a compound expression like the sum of the product, the sum of, of one and the product of two and three and four, okay? So I've got, so the sum takes three arguments, one of which the middle, the middle one is a product. That, that expression is waiting for at some point is waiting for that product. In particular, I can't do any of the add until that product comes in. What's going on there is that the, another way to think about that is that the, that the interpreter is got a procedure that takes one argument called the continuation that's waiting for that answer and will then pass that to the, the addition. That's called the continuation. And if you write your interpreter correctly so that everything in the interpreter and therefore in the compiler is continuation passing correctly, then you have what's called a continuation passing interpreter. And once you have that, you could also return that continuation to the user somehow, in which case you get call with current continuation. That's just an, a simple way of doing it. Anyway, I needed that because I wanted to be able to do something that makes, makes all of this work nicely. And I'll probably explain that. But first I want to just show you what the what the setup is once I've done that. What I really have to do is I have to give the handlers for everything. So I'm going to have a, for the provenance layer, I'm going to have a, a default value, which is the empty set. I'm using lists as sets, okay? So I have a, an empty set. Um, I have a, a union uh, of those. Because many, much of the time when I'm dealing with a provenance, the most important thing to do is say, ah, oh, these all here are all the contributions. I want to union those together. And so there's a little bit of that. And then there's the yeah, and then there's some, you know, the special thing for dealing with some some of the primitive procedures. Okay, let me see where's my there's my uh, mouse. Okay. And then there's a special setup for for conditionals which is also unioning stuff. This is very, very complicated in, in the insides of the interpreter. But what's happening is I'm making a handler so that the results of the predicate calculation can contribute to the results of the consequent or the alternative calculation for provenance. That is, if I determine that the predicate part of a, of a conditional is true, Okay, what that means is I have to say, I'm picking out the consequent to be evaluated and the, the provenance of the, of the result of that has to be the combination of the provenance of the predicate plus the provenance of the consequent. So that's the provenance of the, of the conditional as a whole. And that has to be arranged. Then primitive procedures have to be given their only, their, 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 their provenance handler, like addition, okay? subtraction. Multiplication has to be a little different for the reason I described. Okay. Uh, division is a little more complicated the same way because it's like multiplication. If the, if the uh, dividend is zero, the result is zero, independent of what the divisor is, unless the divisor is zero, in which case we get an error. Okay. There are also, you know, there are, there are uh, comparators that have to be told what to do. The, all I care about in the, there is, is I care about the, the arguments, the provenance of the arguments to produce the provenance of the Boolean result. OK, 
Okay. There are one argument functions like exponentiation, sine, cosine, et cetera. And there are a lot of those. And then there are Karkutter and Kant's and everything else. And just for every primitive, I'm giving a layer. Then there's, I don't even want to get into this. Okay. This is the, the fact that there's a, I have to describe how to write a signer. Okay. And how to sign, assign procedures and so on. I'm going to ignore it. But that's, I had a lot of trouble with that. It took me a while. The really important thing is this. Okay, tail recursion. And I want to make this clear to you what it means. For those of you who are not familiar with this, there, I could write factorial as a recursive procedure like this, as you all know. Factorial of n, if n is zero, the result is one. In other words, it's n times factorial n minus one. Because of the fact that this factorial of n minus one has to be computed before the product can be computed, the product has to wait for that result. Therefore, there's a stack frame produced for catching that answer. So this builds up linear stack. It's linear in, the, in, the, in N. However, I could write it differently this way as an iterative procedure. I could have a procedure, which is a two, two, two uh, numbers, a product and a counter. Okay, It's initialized to one and one. If the counter is greater than N, then I've got the product. So that's okay. Otherwise, I go around the loop, multiplying the counter by the product and adding one to the counter. This does not have to build stack because there's nobody waiting for this answer. The only guy who's waiting for this answer is way back over, over here, the guy who called factorial. Okay. So there's only one continuation waiting for this answer. So this is constant stack. Okay, rather than this, which has linear stack. So that's called tail recursion or tail, uh, tail, tail call optimization. Okay? And the scheme, we do that, and I care about it a lot because it makes the language very simple, which means, and the reason why I like the language very simple, the bottom language, I don't care if you build you know, lots of useful, useful macros and things that look, turn it into while loops and, and for loops and all that, I like to have the bottom language very simple. So the interpreters and compilers are very simple. So I can rewrite the interpreter very fast. I can do experiments with the whole language and everything works. Okay. So now the, here's the, the trick. Okay. The essence of tail call optimization is that the mechanism of procedure call itself does not push stack. That's strange, right? It's not like other languages. The mechanism of procedure return does not pop stack. If any information like the environment or the return address will be needed after a call, the caller pushes that information. The caller is responsible for popping what is pushed. This is called a, a pure caller saves convention, which is not what they do in say C. A layered procedure has multiple components. Each component must be produce a value. Those values must be combined. Is that a contradiction? I, for months, I was stuck on this. But it's not the case. Okay. What I can do is I can augment the continuation to collect and combine the results of the layers. And that extended continuation is still one continuation. So it's only allocated once on the stack. Okay. This extended continuation provides a locus for collecting the information from the predicate of a conditional with the values of the consequent, for example, or alternative. But also, it's for, it works for tail calls. So what I'm doing is I've changed the interpreter by augmenting every continuation in the, in the continuation passing interpreter with an extension that can catch stuff. Okay? But that extension doesn't grow in except for the data that's put into it. It doesn't, doesn't, there's, there are not more layers added in. Layers, wrong word. More stack frames added in. Okay. So let's go add a units layer just to show you. Okay. So now I'm going to have to put in, I have to put in handlers for the, all the primitives. I'm not going to show you what the handlers look like. They're pretty simple. Well, they, what they, this one's doing is checking that all the inputs in, uh, are, have the same units and then make sure the output has that units. And that's true of, of subtraction. From multiplication, 
Well, I'm going to multiply the, the, uh, the units, okay? For division, I'd have to divide the units, okay? And what multiplying units means is basically the units are things like, you know, kilograms cubed. Well, multiplying that by uh, kilograms to the minus one gives me kilograms squared. So it's really just adding exponents. Um, there is the equality, uh, you think of the comparators, the output is unitless because it's a Boolean, but the inputs all have to the same units, okay? Uh, these are, again, exponentiation. In exponentiation, they, all of the standard complicated functions are, are unitless input and output. Square root is special. It divides its, the units of its input by two. Well, it takes the square root of the unit, which is dividing the exponents by two. And now we can do an exam, do the example and show it to you. So continuing with the same, the same thing I had before. I'm going to add another layer. Remember, we already had a layer for provenance. Okay, so here the saturation current is in amperes. Okay. The charge on an electron, which was told to us by NIST is now coulombs, which is amperes times seconds, which is literally just a list here of amperes and seconds. These are the exponents. The Boltzmann's constant is actually joules per Kelvin, which I'm writing here in the traditional way. Okay, I actually, could, if I put little squiggly brackets in, I could do this with tech, okay? But let's not worry about that. So that's kilograms meters squared per second square per Kelvin. Okay, the temperature is in kelvins, and voltage is is kilogram square meter. Okay, voltage is basically um, uh, what is it? It's 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 joules per meter. Okay, so that's what's happening here. I think. Mm. No, I just said that wrong. No, it's a it's a joules per kilogram. Excuse me. Okay, so that's what this is. Mm. And um, and so I hope I wrote that right. The answer is right, so I don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> Whether or not I wrote it this way right is wrong, it's a different question. Okay, and so I run, if I put in my, my if I just look at, for example, uh, what that object looks like, it's a thing with a provenance, with a units layer, and a, and a, and a number, okay? But the original program, we can still work with it. It's, we don't have to change anything to deal with units, okay? It still has the signature in for, by assigning the formula by Searle and Gray. But now if I, if I put in a, a voltage with units that was signed by me, out comes exactly what I expect, okay? I get the, I get the provenance for the, the call. I get the provenance for the result. I get the the units of the result, and I get the the uh, the the one point two milliampere's output. Okay, so this is what's going on in my head right now. I'm sort of beginning to summarize. The idea of layering seems right to me. What it's doing is it's factoring the problem of programming into smaller pieces, and that's always better. It's dividing it up so that my poor program over here, this program is not covered with lots of detail the same way, you know, if you're writing in Java, you have to, um, what's the right way to say it? It requires a great deal of ceremony to get anything to work, okay? And that's because you have to make the, the compiler writer happy by putting in all sorts of detail that's irrelevant to your idea, okay? That's a problem in, in most languages. But Java is a beautiful example of one that does it to the to a great extent. Makes it really hard to write code, and to see what you wrote. Okay, I want to keep my code to be simple. This is my simple code, but I want to be able to it, it be I, I dynamically add layers. Okay, without changing my code, I want to extensively ex dynamically extensively annotate something with metadata without actually changing my, the pro program I'm writing. And this is, so it means that there's gotta be ways of, 
of of writing the layers, okay, and hooking them together with the with the uh, the code base that you're working on. My my experiment here that I'm showing you with changing the, an interpreter, writing my own little interpreter, is it's not hard to approximate. I need layered objects and I need small modifications, perhaps the interpreter compiler. If you know enough about interpreters and compilers, which of course I do, uh, it's not a big deal to do that. But it took me a great deal of effort to think out that that extension of the continuation objects in the interpreter. Um, there are lots of, you know, unsolved problems. There's a painful problem of I/O, which is related to the challenge of editing a program factored in this way. One thing that, uh, you know, my favorite program at all, all, my favorite piece of software ever written is Emacs, okay? Because Emacs was written 40 years ago and it keeps being extended and it keeps working and it works really reliably and really well, okay? And the one nice new thing that's been put into it recently in the last five years is org mode, which is sort of like a layering for text, Okay, you could put in the your, your code, you could put in, you could put in, uh, so you could have sort of what would be called literate programming style. You can put, you could get it to output in, in LaTeX, you could get it to output in, in uh, tech info, you could get it to output and do all sorts of things. You could put pictures in and everything else. And it's a great thing. And it's an outline. Okay. And you could have different layers with different layers of detail. Okay. So I'm inspired by that, but I don't know how to do it yet. Okay, so what I'm saying is I need your help. Okay, you're, you're the you're the power. Okay, I'm just producing ideas. Yes, indeed, there are some problems. In general, conditionals need special treatment. The provenance of an if is the provenance of the provenance is a combination of the provenance of the predicate part and the provenance of the selected alternative. There's a problem with tail recursion. Okay, because I have to make a layered object at the end, but perhaps that idea is wrong. I have solved these both of these problems by making a new interpreter, but is there a way of fully implementing layered systems without a new interpreter? Is there some trick I hadn't thought of? I don't know. Okay, maybe you have an idea. Okay, and what would an I, what would, uh, oops, that's got a problem. That should be an, and not and. What would an IDE for layered systems look like? Is there a kind of Emacs-like structure that we can invent for being able to edit these layered systems so that the various layers can be hooked together, okay, and yet we can separate them to work on them separately? Okay, so that's that's where I need your help. Okay, I need your help in one more way. Okay, everything I do. And all my books, okay, are basically free, okay? I want to support, I want you to support and contribute to free software, where free means, doesn't mean free as in, as money. It has nothing to do with free as in free beer. It's free as in free speech, okay? So please support and contribute to free software. Thank you. Now I'm happy to take questions. Fantastic keynote, Jerry. Um, I wanted to say that predicate-based dispatch procedures personally are some of my favorite techniques that I've learned to adapt from your work to my work. And I've benefited a lot from that, so thank you. And I look forward to extending that with what I've learned from you today. And so to everybody else, we would like to go into the next section and we'll have the opportunity to take some questions from you. But first, we'd like to do a fun little show of books. I know a lot of us have these handy. Uh, uh. And so if we can get these handy and uh, turn your cameras on, we're going to see how many we can get. Yeah, come on. Going to give More. you. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll wait for like a minute. Everybody grab it. And then I will be taking a <laughs> screenshot. It's old. Oh, Jerry, Jerry's got many. Okay. I don't have four hands. <laughs> okay. Five, four, three, two, 
one. All right, keep them up. Screen shutting. Woo. Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, let's start like the um, Q and A. I just wanted to repeat a little bit the mechanism of the Q and A. Um, please raise your hands uh, if you want to ask a question. We'll go with the uh, raised hands first of all for interaction, or post your question on the. Uh, QA channel, QA dedicated channel. So we have already a few. Um, we can take James uh, first, which I see, who I see here at the top. Should I allow? Yes, sorry, go ahead, James. Hey there, Dr. Sussman. Thanks so much. Um, the one of the a while ago, I was very inspired by uh, the concept of generics. This is, of course, before layer procedures came out. And I wrote a what I thought at the time was an extremely readable um, uh, program, at least at the top level, at the, the top level elegant main function. And I came back to it about, you know, two years later, and I had to... Uh, to modify it and to basically take the complex data type that was returned by it and then add another operation onto it and do some further things. And, and what I found was, is I had difficulty uh, knowing what it was actually doing at that point. Cause I could read it like an English sentence at that point. It was very beautiful, but uh, I had difficulty with the code navigation because I was using um, a dynamically typed language and I wasn't able to sort of navigate without doing some complex debugging down there. Now, I, I, the methodology that you've outlined here, and I think the interpreter might be part of the answer for this, but I was kind of curious if you had any thoughts on good ways to organize the code, at least in terms of code organization, so that when you know, for instance, uh, let's say that you're, the locality of the declaration of your data type is not visually near where you end up using. Let's say you just have some variable Q right there or something like that it's not necessarily immediately obvious to me what the effect the plus operator is gonna have on it. And then I've defined various behaviors for the plus operator all over the place. Um, and it's difficult for me to tell from like the argument signature, what type that is or what sort of operations it's supposed to support. So it's kind of curious if you've dealt with anything like that and what your uh, techniques you use for um, uh, yes. working with uh, navigating those generics. Fine, that's a great question. And it's very interesting. Um, the way in which I think about it is two ways, actually. There is a traditional thing that you would learn from perhaps early programming, where you have a big string of a conditional with a big string of, of uh, you know, condiqu mumble quote foo, okay, for a whole bunch of, of types, okay, and that that would be the way you would just make a dispatch on the arguments to a, to a function. The functional sort of fun, all possibilities. Then there's the thing you learn from the object oriented world, which is you organize it by the data type and you put the handlers in the data type for all the same operators. Okay. And of course, the real truth is that it's really a, a table, which is a sparse table, which is the operations and the opera and the, and, the, and the types, okay, which you're filling in some and other, some of the others. Um, and so you could organize it by the operator or you could organize it by the type. And not only, but the operator organizing by the type, which is sort of the object-oriented view, is not very good for, for multi-argument functions. Okay, that's, so because it becomes a, a, a rather high dimensional table. So I like to think of term, things in terms of the table itself, just to be very clear. Okay, I, I tend to not want to, uh, want to, decide a priori that I have something that looks like an object or something that's being a dispatched by by conditionals. Uh, now the, the the that does yield does produce a a bit of a uh, a way of confusing yourself, which is what you're alluding to. What I tend to do is I uh, I tend to organize the material based on the meaning. That is, uh, for example, I might say that there's a whole bunch of things that have to do with making a symbolic extension to my arithmetic. Okay? The symbolic extension does not interfere with any of the numerical stuff, the old numerical stuff. Okay, So 
it, it, I never have to think about it if I'm changing the numerical stuff, okay? It doesn't hurt, okay? Or if I change the symbolic stuff, that doesn't hurt the numerical stuff. And then I might do, I might add the automatic differentiation uh, structure, okay? That by adding, for example, dual numbers, okay? That doesn't, it doesn't cause any trouble, okay? Because all the old stuff still works. So if I think of it only as, I'm, all I'm ever doing is modifying a system by adding new, new, new capabilities, it's additive. The real problem has to do with whether or not I want to change the old, the, the bottom layer, okay? That's, I think, what you're worried about. So for example, a, a possible bug that could come up is supposing I'm, I'm, I'm doing arithmetic and I have, you know, I have some complicated algebraic expression and I extend it to matrices, okay? Whoops, but I might, but remember matrices are not commutative. Therefore, multiplication of matrices. Therefore, if I did multiplication in my original program, I've just introduced some bugs, right? And the problem is knowing that you knowing that you have to go back and fix that. Is that is that helping? Is that helping you? That's a really good example of of it, and I love the idea of organizing it in a table. And I think that really plays in well with your idea uh, idea that we could use some better IDE tooling to support these sorts of ideas uh, yes. as well, like being able to not just not just mentally, but to visually see that table. Because sometimes if I come back to something two years later, even if it was crystal clear to me at the time, I have no idea what, what that mental table is uh, anymore. So um, exactly. yeah, great, great thoughts though. But does that, so that helps you. I, that's what I was hoping. I, I mean, yeah, I don't know yep, exactly sure whether my answer got to, got to your point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, we have another hand up here, Edward Hughes. Hey, hey Professor Hussman. Thanks for the, the talk. I uh, just, I had a question more about uh, pedagogy, and uh, one of the themes uh, running through structure and interpretations of classical mechanics uh, is that uh, sort of intuitionistic and unclear mathematics uh, and notation can get in the way of reasoning about problems and, and solving them. Now, in in undergraduate calculus, uh, some of us might recall we were we were told that we cannot treat dy and over dx as a fraction, uh, even though a lot of the symbolic manipulation in, that we do in math and physics requires exactly that. Um, and now with dual numbers, uh, you, you sort of extend your number system a bit, so you can actually do that. And given that it's such uh, a powerful programming tool, I was wondering uh, if you had any thoughts to whether uh, its introduction to freshman math classes could have a similar effect that uh, SICP does uh, on people trying to learn uh, freshman level computer science. I see, okay, that's very interesting. The, the motivation, a lot of the motivation came from, for, for SICM, came from reading these physics texts and realizing that they were hard to read. Okay. And part of the reason was, of course, that the, the math was, as I say, in, in impressionistic, which means it left out a lot of detail. Okay. It was sort of just sketches of what's going on, and programs are not like that. But the other thing that's special is that Leibniz notation, the dy by dx notation, is very misleading when you go to high dimensions or higher dimensions. Uh, I was inspired when I was an undergraduate at MIT probably before most of you were born. Um, there was a, a, a book I got, I suppose it was referred to me by Marvin Minsky, okay? Which was Calculus on Manifolds by Spivak, okay? It's about a hundred pages. It's a delicious book, okay? It's a, and the, the whole purpose of this book is to start with start with basic principles and get to, Stokes theorem, which is the n-dimensional def the the n-dimensional um, what's the right word generalization of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is that derivatives and integrals are are inverses of each other. Um, and th this book had the property that it, it 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 alerted me to the problem that that Leibniz notation was confusing. Okay, you could get into all kinds of paradoxical uh, situations by doing the division, as you say, of, you know, d by dx, 
and thinking that that's what's happening. Uh, in fact, he starts out, but he he's the guy who pretty much alerted me to the fact that what I really want is derivatives of functions, not derivatives of expressions. Okay, which is the big D operator is derivative of functions. Okay, so going down that path, of course, you can eventually transform this in when you get do when I did the functional differential geometry, there is an interpretation of the dibba dx and dx. Okay. And those are the those are um, basis vectors and covectors in the in in the manifold. In the, in the tangent tangent space for manifold, and that's very that's very and the cotangent space, and that's very that's that simplifies matters. So then it looks like you're doing the your arithmetic on the d by dx and dx type objects as if they were sort of divisions, even though it doesn't you don't have to think that way, but it just justifies that. Okay, but you have to build that through the understanding of the capital D. I think that we would be that the that introductory calculus would be vastly improved if we got rid of Leibniz notation and used the big D and talked about functions the same way that that uh, that Spivak did in his little book. Is that helpful? Uh, yeah, that, that was, that answered my question. That was more or less look what at, I was thinking. Look on page 40, I think it's 40, 44 on in Spivak's book. I'm just pulling it out of my memory, where he gives a he has a diatribe a, a diatribe against Leibniz notation. Oh, I'll, I'll have to look that up. Thank you. Yes. Another raise hand, Ag Davis. Take it away. Hi. Right, thanks so much for the talk. That's a really fascinating idea uh, that I'm going to keep thinking about. Um, very, very simple question. Um, what are some other layers that you can imagine being useful besides units and provenance? Oh, or even well, one, maybe... well, one that's really nice is, is types, okay? And, and type inference. Type inference is really easy to do, it turns out. And uh, we, in fact, in our new book, uh, we could give a very simple uh, several page building of, of type inference. Okay, uh, in, it takes only a few pages, you know, to just show how to do it. Okay, but um, the the point is that's something uh, I like type inference. What I'd like, I, I don't want, I, I dislike languages where there is enforced, there's enforcement, sort of a libertarian programmer. Okay, but I but I do like to get the information that the types gives me. Okay, and so I think it's I, I think that's an example of a nice layer. Uh, there are many other layers I can I can think of that would uh, that are are uh, very helpful. As I said, things like uh, tracking some of the uh, of the uh, uncertainty in a, in a number. Now, remember that's hard. That the the, the uh, for example backwards backwards uh, uh, inference of 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 a, a exactness is insanely difficult work. Yeah, you know, floating point is the scariest business in all of in all of computer science, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, if, if I were to it, to be perfectly clear about it, and the only reason I'm willing to fly in an airplane is because it's a test pilot. Not <laughs> I don't I don't trust floating point numbers, but but that's an example. Uh, what other things could I think of that are that are uh, really useful in, in there? Uh, I want to be able to uh, talk about. I want to be able to. Put on things like wrappers that are paranoid programming wrappers. So, for example, I mean, I'll give you a simple case where it's where it's where it's it's trivial. You know, I want to say the output of this procedure. I know what it ought to be approximately. A reason that re, okay, given the inputs, I want to have a an approximate answer that's computed that I'm comparing every time with the output. Okay. Because the same way I do it when I'm, I'm doing real problems, I, I, I don't know if my computation is right until I said, is it reasonable? You know, if, if it turns out that an orbit of a planet I'm computing happens to they have a planet, a planet X crashing into Jupiter, it's obviously wrong. Okay, so I want to know, I want to have that kind of idea. So there's reasonable wrappers that I want to put on things. Um, I want to uh, imagine that... Uh, 
uh, that I, I'm, of course I'm doing symbolic evaluation as well. That's very useful. If I'm debugging a complex numerical problem, then one of the ways to do it is look at the symbolic representation of the result and see what my, what I actually am I'm computing. But way, when back, way back when I was developing the digital orrery, which was a piece of machine machinery for doing orbital mechanics calculations, this was in the 80s. I did it when I was on sabbatical at Caltech. <clears throat> and uh, I have a bunch of friends helping. Uh, I made a special machine for doing orbital mechanics calculations. And one of the uh, things we did is we did the computer-aided design of the hardware with code that I had written to do the computer-aided design. But one of the things I did is I made it so we could symbolically evaluate the, 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 what went through the chips, okay? So that in the simulation, so that I could put in, I could, I could say, here's a floating point number and these two pieces of it, and they get recombined over here and so on. And I eventually, so I could put in the algebra expression that was the thing I was trying to compute and then compare it with, the, uh, uh, with what it actually did, okay, at every stage. So that's the sort of thing I want to be able to do in everything. I, it's sort of a, I want to have lots and lots of ways of, of making sure my code is good. Which, which is not the same thing as trying to prove it correct. Totally. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Oh, no, that helpful? Awesome ideas, yeah. Okay, we have another hand raised from Philippa Silva. Um, hi. Uh, sorry to parrot everyone else, but thank you so much um, for your talk. Um, I, I have a very concrete question. Like you, at some point you were listening, okay, like we, we, have, um, we have to define how the arguments for all of these operations um, how we're actually going to process this information, the, this extra information, this metadata. And it's like on addition, you combine it, et cetera. And then you got to multiplication. And, and you mentioned that multiplication by zero, um, if I remember correctly, you kind of discard all of this extra information. Um, it's which kind of some of the information. Yes, it discards some. the, yes. So my question there is, why does it actually, so because like, okay, you return the zero. But some of the one of the arguments certainly was zero. Why is the information for that zero not being used? So, like the question is actually, uh, which zero is actually being returned and which if information associated? Because presumably, like if this is just yes. like you know the nil element, there's a nil element somewhere that says yes. you know the provenance of this nil element is you know this proof, etc. Okay, very good. You caught it. Very interesting. A very interesting question. Uh, the answer, of course is that you're absolutely right, okay? The, the result being zero depends upon any zero in the inputs, right? But supposing there are two zeros in the inputs to a multiply, okay? Then it's the, it's the disjunction of those two rather than the, than the, than the so it's, it's either this set or that set, but we don't know which, right? So that's really actually a, a place where backtracking can be useful. What that really is, is a place where we're saying that the actual, the actual provenance is an AMB. If you know what AMB is. AMB is, a, is, a, is a, the procedure invented by John McCarthy to de describe non, non, what's it called? Um, basically non-deterministic uh, automata which is amb of any number of arguments is one of the arguments, but I don't know which. Okay, and so the, the way to say this is that the provenance of something with several zeros in its inputs is the, is the amb of the provenances of the pieces that, 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 that were the zeros. And I didn't do that here because of course, writing that code is big and complicated. And of course I have to do that if I'm doing a serious thing, okay? And I couldn't put that on the slides. How's that? <laughs> that answers my question. Thank you very much. And thank you for the question. That shows you were really sharp and caught it. <laughs> James, do you want to ask the next question? Yeah, I'd love to. Okay, this is a bit of a softball question for you, Dr. Sussman. Um, but I don't. I haven't seen the answer online or explained anywhere else. So I'm just really curious. What is the story with the hat? The hat? The, your, your Shriner hat that's on every picture oh, of you. Oh, 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 okay. Yes. Way back in 
when I was the running the introductory class, 6001 at MIT, which was the thing that Abelson and I actually ran it together and we wrote the book SICP, okay? I would give a lecture every term, which is the eval apply interpreter lecture, okay? And that lecture was always done as a fanfare, a lot of, lot of, uh, of uh, you know, of effects. I would blow things up. I, you know, use magician type tricks with, you know, with stuff that would, uh, would explode and things like that because it's sort of magical, okay? In other words, the very fact that you can make an eval apply interpreter and uh, it, it looks like that the, what does that mean? What does it mean for the, the system to sort of raise itself by its own bootstraps, okay? And it's beautiful, uh, and of course it does. And to explain that is it required some sort of fanfare. It was always a fun sort of, um, a fun sort of performance, which I would do. And I wear this hat, hat as a magician hat. Okay, Hal wore a different one. He wore a pointed one when he did the lecture. You know, sort of the wizard, the traditional wizard hat. So that's all it came from. How's that? That's great. Thank you. Love that hat. Favorite hat. So we have Sebastian Crane that has their hand up. Okay. Hello. Thank you. I, I have two questions. And, and the first is uh, about your talk, and which was very interesting. And the second is a more practical question about using the scheme programming language. Um, so my um, my first question was that uh, uh, when you mentioned the signing of values and functions, is that cryptographically signing or, or some other mechanism? No, no, that, 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 I used the word sign. I probably shouldn't have used the word sign. What I mean is that that's just a trib an attribution of who is responsible for this value or where that value comes from. Uh, indeed, you know, if I were worried about about uh, making this uh, secure, of course we'd use cryptography. But as an old locksmith, I will tell you that cryptography doesn't answer a lot of questions anyway about security. Another way to say that is when a when burglar uh, goes after your house, it doesn't matter how good the lock is, he breaks down the door. Right? <laughs> Perfect way of describing it, yeah. So, okay. so my second question was um, directly related to what I did earlier today, in fact, which was writing a scheme program to uh, use the libnotify library, which is a C library. And I was wondering if you had any suggestions on how to write um, code that called C code in, the, in an elegant way, because just <laughs> <laughs> copying C expressions doesn't sound terribly nice. So I was wondering if you had better suggestions for that. Actually not, but I'm going to tell you the real story that I think. I think the, probably the main reason why Lisp didn't make it as a major language in the world is because it refused to in, make an easy far, far, foreign function interface to see. And the reason why it generally does refuse to do that is because Lisp is its own operating system, right? You, you don't want to, what you basically try to do is it, you don't want to, C programs are, are bad enough so that they, they can clear memory. They, they can basically destroy evidence of why they fail. Okay, and the nice thing about list programs is that list programs, when they fail, you have, you're still there in the a live interpreter and you can look around and see what happened. Okay, and you could fix it. And you can understand it and, 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 uh, and mm. respect all the pieces. And this, is the, this has been the big fight, of course, that, that, that most of the time you really don't want to, to incorporate C code into your memory image. What you want to do is to have, a, have what the operating system does, which is have a separation of processes, memory spaces. C, is, C code is so dangerous that may as well just connect to it by some good foreign function interface that goes through, a, goes through sockets or something. And that's not bad. And these days, machines are fast enough. So unless you're doing that on high, at very high rates, it's not a it's not an expensive proposition. Okay. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. So, so it, it might is, be Yeah. So I would make as a server, a little server in C for problems that you want to you want to call up. Okay. And you make and you make a a foreign function interface in, in your scheme or Lisp. And I, I have one right now that was made by one of my former students that allows me to call other pieces of code. Hmm. Thank you for the suggestion there. So um, writing the, the core 
uh, interoperability parts in C and then using a socket, for instance. That's a really nice idea. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Um, Dustin, do you want to get the next one? By the way, I, just want to say, I, I have to leave at 4 because I have another meeting, believe it or not. Oh, yeah. Oh, fine. Okay. Explain okay. Strangely enough, I have a meeting. Huh? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. We'll try to make it quick, yeah. Yeah. Jerry, can you explain again what you mean by layered Emacs and what you're looking for? What I'm looking for is a is a convenient mechanism for, where, that I have where I can edit my base code, okay, or any layer, and make sure they still retain can, are connected correctly, okay. Such that if I've layered procedures. And if I edit them, I can, or manipulate them, I can, I can walk around and see only the part that I'm interested in. Just the same way that the architect could look at the, at the part T, the diagram, the base diagram of a, of a structure he's trying to design and pick off the plastic sheets and put them down and say, I only want this sheet, but not that sheet. You see, that sort of thing. So I'd like, if supposing I wanted to take my program and I only want to see the type the type information those are all numbers okay or i might want to say no they say take it well, except for there's a boolean somewhere or i want to say take that off and i want to see the the provenance information or i take that off and i want to see you know and i want to work on that on each piece Does so you, want, you want to see the live runtime state of the running process per various la layers yes and you want to be able to edit that you want to be able to your whole program because indeed I want live. I, I believe that the right way to think about things is the code lives for a long time, right? This is not a, I don't like having to reboot things and, or, uh, you know, recompile and reload every five minutes. That's a different kind of programming than the interactive way I like to live. Yes. And Jerry, should we email you directly with, when we find the answer to this, is there a GitHub there repo? People, if anybody wants to, so are talking to me, I just, I have, I have an email address. It's at MIT, right? I'm gjs at mit.edu. And if you want to talk about this stuff, great. And we should figure out how to solve, you know, Sam Ritchie is a good intermediary because he talks to me all the time. Okay. So he, he can, he can be a person you can contact who knows how to, uh, how to uh, uh, catch me at the right times. Yeah. So I uh, have, Sam is. I, I do not have a cell phone, by the way. I do not carry one. Oh. Sam is in the uh, keynote, uh, the, the keynote Discord channel. So if you if you want to maybe to chat with Sam, so you can be a little bit of an intermediary between like the emails and so on, then that's right. a like a good a study group that can happen there. Right. And, and yeah, it'd be good to do that to have a nice such such arrangement of people who are really interested in trying to figure out layered layered programming as a a thing that you can play conveniently rather than what I'm doing. I'm just developing the infrastructure. I'm a plumber. Uh, the designer, perhaps. Plumber. plumber. I'm figuring okay. out how you hook it together, but I don't know how to make the, the nice user interfaces. I've never done that well. I, okay, I we're have a gonna question. Take... Oh, sorry, Jordan, go ahead. Well, I want to follow up on how do you not have a cell phone? How do you do 2FA without a cell phone? I don't... I. People didn't have cell phones in 50 years ago. Well, uh, thinking... two-factor authentication with everything that makes you, it texts you the little, code have, and then you have to, you know. I have a dongle. I have a little dongle that I plug into my computer and when I have to two-factor authenticate. Okay. Oh, okay. But I don't, but I, I, I don't, I, look, I'll tell you, I had a student who I told, monitor all the radio communications on his cell phone for a month. He threw it away afterwards. Because all the it's a, it's a privacy violation. Machine is a, a is a is a thing that's sitting there telling everything about you to people you don't want to know, to have know about you, like where you are, what you're doing, who you're to, who you're with. Do you want that information being transmitted all the time to people who basically sell that information to each other? Okay, so I just don't yeah. have one. I'm yeah, on the I think you. You suggested a really great solution with uh, doing all your 2FA on a dongle because that's that's the problem and, that I know people are trying and, to get around is those. Codes. And, you know, if, if, if people worry about emergencies, we didn't have these problems 30, 40 years ago or so. We get you know, the old fashioned, well, landline telephones worked very well. 
Wonderful. Well, we have a hand raised from Mike Nardell here. Uh, hello, and, and thank you very much, Professor Sussman. Uh, I'm not, this might be a pretty obvious question or, or maybe a comment I'm raising, but it, but it seems like one of the, one of the aspects of what you're proposing is it would, it would with, with layered approach, is it would subtly maybe push programmers towards really refining that base layer so that it really captures the essence of the meaning and that subsequent layers could, could actually build upon that in meaningful ways. So that maybe, you know, again, sometimes you write a function and it's really beautiful and captures really the meaning of what you want. And then sometimes it's just gunk. And it, it seems to me one of the interesting aspects of, of this is it really, it really leads people like me, perhaps more towards that beautiful expression of the idea and, and rather, and away from the, the, the gunk. Uh, I don't know if that's a overly simplistic in, interpretation. Well, that's certainly what I intend. What I intend is to encourage you to make your code so you can read it next year. Okay. The most terrible thing about a piece of code is you elaborate it to put in all the special things you want to make it make happy about it, like the, you, all the things that are in, enforcing the types and and making sure that the that the, uh, all the details are exactly right, and then you can't read it because it's full of detail. You want those details to be pushed to places where that detail is separable. So I agree with you completely. That's my goal. Okay, we are gonna take. Um... A question from Discord now, uh, maybe a couple, and then you probably leave, uh, need to leave. I have no idea what Discord you... is. <laughs> oh, sorry, from the chat. Um, Got it. We just, we just want to make sure we can take another picture with you because a few people were not able to turn on their camera, so we can have like a larger grid, and we want to try that before you go. But okay. before, let's grab a question from Discord. So uh, did you know about the kernel programming language from John Schutt? It is a scheme like Lisp with orthogonal first-class continuations and first-class environments, allowing non-massive expression by using its very elegant vowel calculus. You know Actually, I don't know about it. Please send me email and I'll read about it. Cool. Is that new or old? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We'll, uh, there's an elaboration of that, but I'll have to go back and read. Well, I um, don't. Another I, the answer is I don't know. Okay. okay. Uh, we'll we'll get that uh, um, question through you via Sam. So even uh, if I squeeze hard, I can see spec being a layer, uh, and I wonder if spec could be used in a way that interacts with object metadata. Uh, this could be closure specs. So I'm not sure we can ask you that because I'm not sure you know closure specs. I don't know closure specs, but if it's if it's a, a, a method, for example, writing contracts about code, is that what it is? Hmm. It's a type. It's, it's similar to um, uh, declarative typing. So yeah, you declare okay. types. Sure, I would love to have that as a layer. Absolutely. Hmm. Okay. So um, another one, Mr. Sussman, can you expand on the details of what makes tail recursion so challenging with layered approach? Oh, I can say it again. The problem is that when I have a layered procedure, it has many components. Each component is computing some result. Those components have to be combined at, after the after the after they all complete, after they get their answer. Okay, that would that that means that there's something that's waiting for that answer, for those answers. If that happens, if that happens in the usual ordinary way, then you end up with a, a stack frame waiting for that, but it waits for that answer. Okay, that doesn't that that that's what makes that would would hurt tail recursion. What I have to do is figure out some way to get rid of that extra stack frame. And the way I do it is by expanding the, 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 the tail recursion, the, 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 the stack frame, or we'll call it the, the continuation is the right word, the continuation that's waiting for the answer anyway. Okay, without the, but it doesn't have to expand linearly in the number of, of guys contributing. It just has to be expand of constant amount, which is the amount needed to, to to capture all that stuff. Okay, is that helpful? I think so. I should show you the details. The details are yeah. are unfortunately there are a lot of pay, many pages of details. 
Yeah, they are telling me, yes, it is helpful. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we have one last question from Discord and then we'll get together for our pictures. So we'll do a redo, everyone get your books again. From EB, we have the question, did you imagine or give any thought about how a security capability layer could work? No. <laughs> and the reason why is security is not easy. Security is security is definitely like floating point numbers, one of the hardest things in, in, in all of computing. I would say security has to be thought of from the beginning. That's one thing that, but the other terrible thing is that security is mostly not about your computer programs. Security is about a system as a whole. And the difficulty is that there are components in the system called people who can easily be caught by things like spear phishing. Okay. So it's not at all clear what you do. You know, tightening up, you know, basically tightening up one, one place, like the software being exactly right, okay, doesn't necessarily help solve the real problem. I think the most important thing, the way I say it from, again, from the locksmith point of view, is the lock on your door does not protect you from the bur burglar. The lock on the door is a signal for to say there is a taboo, a social taboo to breaking this door down. And we're going to enforce this taboo by, by, by legal means. That's that we don't have to figure out how to do that in the computer industry or in the, you know, especially in the network. And I think we have to figure out how to make taboos that are enforceable if we really want real security. Is that helpful? We think so. Okay. 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 Everybody so gather your books thank, again. Yeah, every, everybody gather the book again. Okay, I'll get a couple of books. And uh, we are going to thank one more time Dr. Sussman for everything he's done for us. Okay, yeah, we, get, we have a good 16 read. Can we make it bigger? Let's see, can we make it bigger? We're going for 20. Five, four, three. Two and one. Good. I also took one. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. It was nice. Nice cover. I'm going to post it straight away. Oh, very. Um, okay. So um, thank you. Big, huge thanks for Jerry for staying with us, inspiring us to learn better ways to program think about problems and design better applications. I think that was like the general message. And um, yeah, thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you. Have a nice day. And I'm going to go away and get into my other meeting <laughs> about the other meetings about about grading class, this class that we just finished this term. <laughs> so it's, you know, okay. teachers. That's, have a good day. Oh, good day. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.